this day, for this time, for this preaching opportunity, Lord. I ask that you would remove me and that you would allow, not only allow, but that you would command your spirit to just take control of everything that is said. And, uh, this is your word, your message, and we want it to be go forth properly so that your people will take it, absorb it, and they will digest it, that they will act on it. This is our prayer, my son Jesus' name we say, amen. 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 The title of today's message is The Bible in a Nutshell. All right. In a Nutshell. Now, how many people here are literary lovers? You? Okay. Praise <laughs> God. You, you tried it? You were just getting ready to block a call for a sneeze? Amen. I remember back in high school, we were tasked to read and study Shakespeare. And that's just one dude I really just could not get into. Uh, all the language and the way that it was written, uh, I just couldn't follow it. Now, I don't know, most people had to read the same thing that I had to read, you know, the Daniel with the Shrew and Macbeth and things of this nature. And, uh, that love story, Romeo and Juliet. I just couldn't read it and understand it. And, and, and if you can't understand something, then it, it, it's, you know, like Paul said, you know, a pile of dumb. If you can't understand it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't prosper you any. Uh, you can go to a class and sit in a class for hours and, and if you don't understand what you have been taught, you have just wasted your time. Amen. Amen. Now, back in high school, we had these things. Uh, y'all probably didn't use them because y'all were studious, but you know, I used to take advantage of what was called Cliff Notes. <laughs> cliff Notes. And Cliff Notes was basically the Reader's Digest version. Uh, it, it, it took out all the fluff and the pomp and the circumstance, and it just told you what you needed to know. Just what you needed to know, just enough so you could get that report written and get a halfway decent grade. Amen? Amen. Now, amen. I could have used some cliff notes last night as I prepared this message for y'all. But we live in a world of instant gratification. Instant gratification. When I was growing up, instant coffee was all the rage. Instant coffee. Well, we just had them, you know, newfangled coffee makers like, you know, today's time. You just drop a cup in there and hit a button, and boom, here comes a, you know, nice fresh cup of coffee. They didn't have all that back then. You know, you could get your coffee freeze dried, <laughs> as if that was the best method of making instant coffee. Your coffee would be described as good to the last drop. Maxwell House. Give them a little plug right there. When I was very young, the first microwave ovens were introduced in the, in, in the name of the Amana Radar Range. And, 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 and that was the must-have appliance for the modern woman's kitchen uh, so that your meals could be prepared in, in, in a, a coincident of the time that it normally took. So you see, a fraction of the time, see everything was about time. And, and even today, everything seems to be about time. We want it quick, 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 right now if not soon. Right now. The quicker the better. Man had realized that his time on this earth was fleeting and, 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 and if we were going to get to do all the things that we wanted to do on our bucket list, then, then we needed to, to, to have fast food, uh, we needed to have the drive through we needed to have uh, the fast lane, the HOV lane, we needed to have the VIP section, we needed to pay uh, a premium so that we don't have to wait in line. We, we, 
we, we, we just don't have the time, see, because we are important, hmm. huh? We, we, we have people to see and things to do, and we just don't have time to sit around and wait for things to simmer. Hmm. We want it now, if not soon. So today we're going to talk about the Bible in a nutshell. Because I know y'all ain't got time hmm. to sit around and read this whole book, this 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 massive uh, 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 collaboration of God that He took all of these spiritual men and, and and dispatched His Holy Spirit to cause them to write all of these 66 books of the Bible. You ain't got time to read all that because you're important. See, so we're going to boil it down for you a little bit today. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to John, the third chapter, and the 16th verse. John, the third chapter, and the 16th verse verse. The Bible, in a nutshell. And most of you know this verse, you know it by heart, you really didn't even have to turn there. I didn't turn there, I didn't have it written in front of me. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him, what's it say? Should not perish. Should not perish. What else? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. Everlasting life. Everlasting life. That's right. For God so loved the world that is the Bible in a nutshell. All right. Hmm? All that stuff in the Old Testament, all that was just leading us up to this point, this point when our Savior, Jesus Christ, was born, lived, died, and resurrected so that we would have an opportunity to have right relationship again with God our Father. Amen. In a nutshell, mm -hmm. that's it. Now I could give the benediction right now. We could <laughs> go eat gumbo. Okay, but let me just work this thing a little bit for those people on Facebook and on YouTube that might be listening in. See, the Bible is full of truth, full of wisdom, all that writing in the Old Testament. It's all basically to teach us just how filthy we are and how much in need we are of a Savior. It's to teach us that in and of ourselves, we are nothing. And that there is a God, a God that loves us so much that he cares enough about us to not only make a way for us to bridge back to him, but to do it through his only begotten son. Mm -hmm. Now I had two sons. I had two sons. I love them both dearly. But even having two, I wouldn't sacrifice one of them for anybody else. Amen. I love all y'all. I ain't sacrificing one of my kids for you. Amen. That's how. Amen. God loved us enough that he sacrificed his only begotten. One whom he loved, one whom he was, is to this day our everlasting Savior. Amen. Amen. God our Father. 
You know, some of us have problems just putting stuff together. And, you know, you buy stuff from the store unassembled, and, and, and you get it home, you get it to the house, and you break the box open, you pull all the parts out. It's got instructions in there. Do we read them? Yes. Do we? Yes. Sometimes. Yes. And sometimes we just glance over it and don't really read it in detail. But we just glance over it. Then we get it all out there and we start putting stuff together the way we think it's supposed to go. And, and, and when we get done, we got pieces left over. <laughs> now, some things are designed, they send you enough because they know that, you know, little screws fall in cracks and crannies and this, that, and the other. So, some things they actually do tell you, you know, there's a couple extra of these screws, there's a couple extra of these screws. And, and, and don't worry about that, but when, when you start ending up with extra stuff that ain't supposed to be extra. <laughs> Amen. Huh? Mm. You, you now, if you're putting together a swing set that your kids is going to be, that could get dangerous. Amen. 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 Or if you're putting together a piano bench. <laughs> huh? Can't hit nobody. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Sometimes we can have the plans and we just know that we we, we, we think that we know how it goes. And, and you know, in our, our own sufficiency, we try to work it out and it just sometimes don't work out right. I remember when we were uh, uh, building this place and I built this platform that the pulpit sits on, and I had it all worked out in my mind. I knew what I wanted to do. So I was able to get the lumber and the screws and the nails and the brackets and everything and frame it up just the way I wanted because I, I had that plan. The plan was in my mind. But when you buy stuff from the store and you don't know the plan, you don't know exactly what the manufacturer had in mind when he uh, fabricated that thing. It might behoove you to take a look at the instructions so that you don't end up with a pile of mess that could hurt somebody or hurt yourself. Often we find caution statements on the items that people will interact with because we don't want anybody to get hurt. <coughs> now we're going to turn back to the book of Matthew and take a look at Christ's teachings during Passion Week. We see that he does just what we're looking for. He is going to boil this thing down to the least common denominator to the most important parts for folks because he, he's on his way to the cross and mm -hmm. time is critical and, and he wants us to have a good grasp, a good understanding of what his whole life is about. So, so, so we, we, we find Jesus, he's just finishing telling three stories, the parable of the two sons, the parable of the tenants, and the parable of the wedding feast. Mm -hmm. Each of these stories pointed out the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, and we're told that, that they were actively looking for a way to arrest him, but they were scared of the people. You see, by this time, Christ had amassed a huge following. Word of him, his acts, his deeds, his words had gone throughout the countryside, and people were coming from miles around to see this man named Jesus. Mm -hmm. One woman said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. And she was. By her faith, she was healed. Pharisees, they began to look for ways to discredit him publicly. 
And we see this in political campaigns today. The incumbent will see a challenger coming from the left or from the right, and, 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 and the idea is to discredit this person so that the voters won't vote for them, won't believe their message, or won't believe that this message is better than their message. And so negative ad campaigns abound. And they were looking for a way to discredit him, a way to trick him into saying something that would prove that he was not a prophet at all, or that he was certainly not the Son of God. They sent their disciples first with a question on paying taxes, hoping that that would get him in trouble with the Roman government. It didn't work, and the Pharisees' disciples were amazed at his answers. See, no weapon formed against him would prosper. Amen. Not only that, but he, his words, his truth, converts non-believers into believers. And this is what started to happen among the disciples of the Pharisees. Next, a group called the Sadducees. Now these, these were a group of men who fancied themselves as being very religious, very pious, very literary, the deep thinkers of the time. As deep thinkers, they concluded that God was a nice idea, a nice thought, and they would accept it, but that they would only consider the present. They would not consider anything beyond this life. There was no heaven and no hell, only the present. They carried their perception of reality uh, of, of the current visible world, only what they could see existed. They carried this into their belief of the future invisible world, refusing to believe that God could do anything other than what they could see before them in the present day. It was a new belief system uh, in Judaism. The Sadducees, their beliefs, their ideas, these were relatively new. When Jesus came along, the Sadducees had only been around for a couple hundred years. A couple hundred years, long time, but still. In the big picture, that was new. I mean, we could say that Mormonism is new. You know, I mean, it's been around as long as we've been born, but in the big picture of things, Mormonism only been around about 150, 150 years or so. So it's new and wrong. Amen. That's another message. <laughs> they would include, uh, 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 see, the Sadducees included Christ and, and, and his way of thinking, his teaching, in their uh, uh, discredited part. They said, no, this can't be the way. Anybody with an idea different from ours is wrong. And we might think that that's something new, but that is nothing new. We have denominations over a thousand different Protestant denominations. And, and, and what makes them all different? Their beliefs, mm -hmm. their articles of faith, their administration, their organization. So something about them is different from all the others, and each one thinks that they are right. And they might be right about some things, mm -hmm. but rarely is anybody right about all things, mm -hmm. unless you are God. The Sadducees posed their question about the afterlife to Jesus, hoping to reduce the idea of immortality of the soul, of heaven, to an absurdity. Jesus wastes little time with these men. He goes right to the root of the issue and says, A, you don't know the scriptures. Eternity is a central theme of the scripture. And Jesus tells them, you don't know the scriptures. 
If you did, you wouldn't be asking me these questions. And B, you don't know God. Hmm. Now, if you consider yourself to be a God-loving, God-fearing person, somebody telling you to your face that A, you don't know the scriptures, and B, you don't know God, would be an insult. Amen. 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 The Sadducees didn't take it quite so much as an insult because they were confounded by the words of Christ. They, 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 he answered them with such authority that, that, that they were these deep thinkers, these, these literary men were reduced to speechlessness. There was nothing that they could say. There's a story told of a young minister who was about to be ordained and the oral interview was not going so well. He was asked to defend his position on a certain topic with scripture. He struggled and he hemmed and he hawed and, and he was getting frustrated because the men that were questioning him had a different interpretation and belief on the subject of which he was questioning. Finally, in frustration, he said to the pastors on the board, if you guys are so smart, you justify your position with scripture. Now, in an ordination interview, this might not be the, <laughs> the, the road that you want to travel, but without raising his head, one of the pastors, an elderly, godly, veteran pastor, began to quote verse, after verse that supported his position. Mm -hmm. He spoke with such eloquence and with such authority that when he had finished, the young minister was completely speechless. This is the way that Christ silenced the Sadducees. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees saw this now, you know, experience is the best teacher. Amen? Amen? I said experience is the best teacher. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? How many of you know that it does not have to be your personal experience? Amen. Amen. Yet yeah, the Pharisees are standing on the fringe, and they're watching this, and they see the interaction of Christ with the Sadducees, and they see him shut them down, shut them down cold. Mm -hmm. And then they back up. It's like, whoa, hold on, wait a minute. We gotta rethink this thing. Uh, we're not dealing with some Rudy poop. Mm -hmm. This fella here knows a little bit, if not a lot, about what it is he's talking about. Amen. Amen. Now in Matthew, if you'll turn with me to chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, I want to read verse 34 through 40. Matthew 22 verse 34 says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. Hmm. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart mm -hmm. and with all your soul and with all your mind. Your heart, your soul, and your mind. Mm -hmm. The first and greatest commandment. Love God with your heart your soul, and your mind. Mm -hmm. 
In the old days of fighting wars, when all of the combat was done hand to hand, if you had suffered great losses, you would retreat, regroup, and have another go at it after you had gathered yourself and, 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 and restocked and resupplied and, 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 and reloaded. That's what the Pharisees do here. Jesus has humiliated them with his parables. He has fielded their questions with authority and ease. Instead of exposing and discrediting Jesus as a result of these confrontations, the people are getting a glimpse of the power and the authority of Christ. So they regroup and they take another crack at it. This time they send a lawyer, an expert of the law, to ask Jesus what is the most important commandment that people should follow. Mm -hmm. The hope was that he would trip himself up with an answer or that he would show an ignorance of the law that would expose him as a phony. Mm -hmm. Now, I've talked before about these Pharisees and what they had done with the, the commands of the law, of the Ten Commandments. They had turned what was to be for their benefit into an impossible system of rights and wrongs that would guilt people into acting a certain way. They had turned the relationship with God into legalism, and the problem with legalism is that the focus is on following laws rather than having a <coughs> right relationship with God. Amen. 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 They had taken ten commandments and the first five books of the Bible had come up with over 600 rules and regulations that they determined had to be followed in order to please God. The thing that made it even more confusing, other than having 600 laws to follow, is that the religious teachers of the day couldn't even agree on which of the commandments were most important to follow. Because let's face it, nobody could follow all 600 plus laws, commandments. I mean, they were so ridiculous, like, you know, you couldn't swat a mosquito on the Sabbath or that was considered hunting on the Sabbath day. Yeah. They would often debate which of the laws was the most important. They believed that if you obeyed many of the heavier laws, that, 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 that the more important laws, that some of the smaller, less important laws you really could overlook those. So, so, so if you don't kill nobody, if you don't rape nobody, if you don't cut nobody, you might can get away with speed. Amen. 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 And see, I, I sent Angel to her room to clean her room up one day, a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> After a while, I went in there and she was playing. And the room wasn't clean. And, and, and I said, Angel, I thought I told you to clean up your room. And she said, well, I made my bed. <laughs> and see, to her, doing one of the things exempted her from all the others. And, see, and, 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 and that's the, the system of the laws that the Pharisees had created was something like this. Each one wanted to concentrate on certain laws. They love to do the things that were easy for them to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm doing this part. If I'm doing this part, you can give me a little exemption on that part. <coughs> so they debated which laws should be worked harder at and which ones were most important. Well, Jesus answers their question, and instead of being trapped or tripped up, Jesus answered, it encompasses all of God's law and God's revelation to the people over the years. Jesus gives us the Cliff Notes version 
of the Old Testament. He says, love God. Love God. That's the most important. And then, love people. That's the Old Testament in a nutshell. Love God. And like unto it, love people. If everything that we did, we did because we loved God and we wanted to show our love for God. And then we loved people and we wanted to show people that we loved them. We would be all right. Amen. Amen. If everything we did had that central theme, All of the law, those things that God commanded his people to obey, not the things that the Pharisees added, talking about the Ten Commandments, and all of the prophets, those revelations from God spoken and recorded by men were summed up in these two commands. Love God. Love people. Amen. The word used here for hang means literally to depend on. Christ said, all these other things depend on these two things. Everything else, you know, do not rob, do not steal, all depends on loving God and loving people. If you love God and love people, you won't rob from them, you won't steal from them, you won't covet what they have. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 God's word is good. Amen. Amen. Think about it. If you take Ten Commandments, the original law handed down from God to, uh, to his people found in Exodus 20, you take those Ten Commandments, these two things cover all Ten Commandments. If you love God, you won't have another God before him. You won't bow down to idols. You won't use his name in vain. You will honor the Sabbath day. If you love people, you'll honor and obey your parents. You won't murder. You won't mess around with someone else's spouse. You won't lie. You won't steal. You won't covet what your neighbor has. Amen. Amen. They're all covered by those two. They are built on and depend on these two truths that we are to love God first and then love our neighbors as ourselves. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? The Pharisees had made the commands of God about the law. Jesus says that they were never about the law. They are about love. Amen. Love God. Amen. Love people. His answer to love is quite a contrast with the ideas and practices of legalism. This goes against what the Sadducees and the Pharisees were trying to preach and teach to the people. And that's why they were opposed to Jesus. But love is what has always defined God and his relationship with us. So it makes sense that it should define us as well. Amen? Let's look first at the first command he gives us in verse 38. Love God. This is the first and the foremost. This is where it all begins. This love will affect every other relationship that we have. C.S. Lewis, if you know C.S. Lewis, he was the one that wrote uh, the Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That same C.S. Lewis. Thank you. He once said, when I have learned to love God better than my earthly dearest. When I have learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. Mm -hmm. Whatever you hold dearest in your heart right now, whoever, whoever you love, and my love sitting right there. But when I learn to love God, I can love her better. Amen. 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 
Now let's stop and be honest with ourselves. How many of us can say that we truly keep this command? You can? Amen. I'm, I'm loving you, brother. It would have been easier for some of us if Jesus had said that the most important commandment was to go to church hmm. or to tithe or to help the poor or to love our families. Amen. These things we can do, it's easy for us, but he says the most important thing mm -hmm. is to love God. Amen. This is to be at the center of everything that we do. I'm going to make you a deacon. <laughs> our lives ought to be marked by a deep love of God. Amen. 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 A story is told of a young father that loved to watch football on Sunday afternoons. Amen. <laughs> His young son would watch with him for a time, but would get bored and would want to do other things. Wow. One Sunday, his son came into the room while he was watching football and announced that he loved him. The young dad smiled and announced to his son, I love you too. Next, his son came over and sat next to him on the couch. <laughs> And again, in a loud voice, he announced to his father, I love you, Daddy. And his dad echoed the sentiment right back and continued to watch the game. The little boy climbed up on his father's chest and took his father's face in his hands and looked him square in the eyes and yelled, Daddy, I love you. <laughs> and the father peeped over and said, uh, don't you love mommy too? <laughs> he didn't want to be distracted from what he wanted to do. He was telling him that he loved him, but his actions were not showing that love. Don't we do that sometimes with God? Don't we stand around and tell God that we love him? Don't we proclaim our love for him? But then sometimes our actions just don't follow through. Amen. Well, it happens. It happens. Of course, the young man was more important to his father than football, but sometimes we just don't show it. Mm -hmm. huh? Many of us have allowed ourselves to become so distracted by other things that we can no longer say that love defines our relationship with God. That's a shame. We can't convince ourselves that we love him and then be annoyed when he wants our time. Well. Huh? <laughs> it is a love that is to consume us. Mm -hmm. Amen? Jesus tells us of the intensity that is to mark this kind of love. We have to love God with all of our heart, mm -hmm. our soul, mm -hmm. and our mind. Our heart. This is the center of our emotions. Many people try to separate their emotions and their Christianity. You mm. can't do that. Amen. Amen. You just can't do it. There is a danger if your, relation, your relationship with God is strictly emotional. Because emotions change. Mm -hmm. Amen. Emotions change and your relationship would be one big roller coaster ride. Whoa. Up today. I thought it was down tomorrow. But you can't love God without an emotional response, and our relationship with Him will cover the whole range of emotions. We can love Him when we're up. Mm -hmm. We can love Him when we're down. We should love Him when we're down. Mm -hmm. Our relationship with Him is to be full of awe, passion, joy, and zeal. Mm -hmm. Amen? We're also to love Him with all of our soul. We ought to love him on an emotional level, our hearts, and we ought to love him on a spiritual and eternal level, our soul. Mm -hmm. The soul is the core of our being. It's who we are when you strip away everything else. This is a level that penetrates deeper than our emotions, for our love for God is to be unshakable. It is to come from the deepest depths of who we are, for we are to love God with all of our soul. Amen. We also commanded to love God with our minds. 
Loving God is not just an emotional thing. God wants us to be convinced with our minds that his words are the truth. This is love on an intellectual level. Intellectual love. Our love for God is to consume all of us. Our emotions, our souls, and our minds are all to be a part of our relationship with God. Amen. Amen. They are to involve in knowing and falling in love with God. We are to fall in love with God. Fall deep. See, you can't pick your family. I mean, you, you get what you get, you get who you get. You know, you get Uncle Earl and, 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 and Cousin Leroy and, 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 and some of them fools. You, you just get them. I mean, that's, you can't pick them, they're yours. You're stuck with them. Huh? Our friends, we can pick. And we can pick to love God. We can choose to love God. We can make a conscious choice based on our knowledge of him and who he is and who he is to us, we can choose to love him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Next he said, love people. Mm -hmm. Our love for God is shown practically through the way we love people. In John 13 and 34, he says, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Verse 35 says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is how people will know that we are Christians. This is how people will know that you are a member of Love Christian Center, by the love you have one for another. In a world where many people just aren't nice. In a world where the credo of the masses is to look out for Number one, Amen. the one who loves God is commanded to put the needs of others first. Amen. Put God first, mm -hmm. then the needs of others. To forgive, to treat people the way that we want to be treated, to display the love of God through the way we live and interact with each other. Amen? This is behavior that will stick out. This is behavior that will be noticed. You are the epistle that some people will ever have a chance to read. We are the only Christ that some people will ever be introduced to. Don't squander that opportunity to show Christ to them. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's behavior that ultimately will point people to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The reputation of God's kingdom has suffered greatly because of mean Christians. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let me say that again. Can I say that again? The reputation of God's kingdom has suffered greatly because of mean Christians. Christians who say that they love God but treat people like dirt. Mm. Jesus says love God and love people. Mm -hmm. Why should we love others? Because God does. <coughs> mm -hmm. That should be reason enough. My parents love my wife. Amen. Amen. My father loves my wife. My mother loves my wife, although sometimes she don't show it. But she does. But they love her because I love her. Amen. Amen. <laughs> First John 4, verses 9 through 11 said, God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. This in verse 10, it says, this is real love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Mm -hmm. Dear friends, yes, thank you. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely, 
ought to love one another. But the, that's the Bible in a nutshell. Amen? The entire Bible is a love story. A story of loving God passionately, pursuing those he created. If we understand this, that God loves each person with the same love that he has for us, it should change the way we treat them. Number two, it reflects God's love. You can't see God, but when his people love others, you get a glimpse of who he is. Amen? Amen? When we show God's love to somebody else, they can get a glimpse of who God is. Mm -hmm. Because they will see God working in and through us. Verse 12 says, No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love has been brought to full expression through us. Mm -hmm. That's a good word. We can't talk about love. We can, we can talk about love. We can preach love. We can be in love with the idea of love. Amen. We can even name our church love. Amen. But until it is shown through the way we treat others, people will not be able to see the reflection of God in our lives. Amen. <laughs> that God meant for us to be. If those two reasons don't work for you, let's try this last reason. We should do it because God commands it. Right. Huh? We've already looked at the verse here in this passage, love your neighbor as yourself. It's a command. Mm -hmm. It's not a suggestion. All right. It's in God's top two. <laughs> love God. Love people. As a Christian, there is no reason, no excuse not to love. Whatever you're holding on to that's keeping you from loving the unlovable in your life, let it go. Give it to God and humble yourself and be obedient to his commandment of love. Try it <laughs> and watch the ways that you'll grow. The ways that God will bless you. The ways that your obedience, your, your, your loving others will, will start to become commonplace. It will become natural. It will become second nature. Amen? Amen. Amen. Love God and love people. All the scriptures hang on, are built on these two commands. Everything that God will ever ask of you, everything that we could ever accomplish for his glory will be found in obedience to these commands in our lives. With love of God, we love God through personal time. We love God through prayer time. We love God through learning about him. We love God by being committed to his church. We love God by being obedient. We love God by living right. We love people through serving them. Amen. We love people through putting their needs first, praying for them, caring for their physical needs, caring for their spiritual needs. Amen. What does this message have to do with missions? Huh? A whole lot. Yeah. It is our mission to love God and to love people. It, it's the basis and the backbone for the existence of the church. If we love other, others, we will uh, will be concerned about their spiritual needs, their physical needs. Uh, when we ask people how you're doing, it won't just be just to start a conversation. We will actually be concerned about them. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. The passage is called the Great Commandment. It, 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 it's a desire to obey the Great Commandment that pushes us to fulfill the great commission. To go out into the world and preach the gospel, to take the gospel into places where if we didn't go, we wouldn't go. A love for God and a love for his people, the people that you will see and hear in your daily walk are human just like you and they need a risen savior. 
just like you. It is that love that you have for God that will spur you on to share that gospel with them. The love that we have one for another will push us, even when we think that we're too shy. Oh, I'm not a preacher. You don't have to be a preacher to tell somebody about the goodness of Jesus. You don't have to be a preacher to invite somebody to come out and hear a man preach about it. Hear a woman preach about the goodness of God. Amen. Amen. We need to love people through word and deed. Amen. 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 Let us stand as we now give opportunity for those that may not have yet accepted Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. As we give an opportunity for invitation for discipleship. <coughs> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the Bible.